to try to survey a bunch of work that we did over the years, starting around 2011 and 12. Uh, so uh, I'll drop in a, num a number of topics, but they all sit under estimating compression and deduplication ratios. Uh, so let's, let's get going. Uh, so let's start with data reduction in general. Really, very briefly, just so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, deduplication. Deduplication is the art of taking very large amounts of storage and identifying repetitions at a large scale, large chunks. So large would be 8K, for example, and avoiding replicating these over and over again. So it's a form of compression, but a, a very large scale. Compression, what we say, so deduplication is compression, but when we say compression, what we mean is local zip style compression, which says let's not look at very large scales, let's take one chunk and say, okay, how, how can you compress this single chunk on its own? So why two techniques for compression? Well, it's pretty obvious. The two techniques affect different workloads, different data types. So, so there's some examples here. Databases, uh, compression is very good with these, with text. Uh, and then deduplication really performs well with backups and virtual images, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, so you want to be effective, you want to use both techniques. So what to expect, really? Uh, and this, this is a big question. This is the question we're, uh, we're trying to answer today. What data reduction to expect? And the answer is going to be very simple. Well, it depends. It depends. And it depends a, lo a lot of stuff here. Uh, but let's say, first of all, I already said that it depends on your workload. Uh, it, the, wo the different workloads, there's going to be really great variance between the two, uh, the different workloads. And some are going to benefit from dedupe, some from compression, some from both. But how much? So, so you benefit, but how much really? And, and the answer is even more complex than that. There's really large variations with the workloads. I'm, not, I'm even ignoring the fact that you can do compression in different ways. It's the data itself that brings in the large variation. The data itself really changes. I took in, for example, we just took three VM repositories. Uh, they're not random ones. We're the ones that we got access to and we could analyze. And we try to understand the deduplication and compression savings for, for both of them. So you see like 54%, 18%, 73 on the overall. Some are good with compression, some are not, some, some are less. All benefit, but, but how much it really varies. I, I, and really you don't, there's no really a good mechanism of knowing. I, if you had to ask my bet, I would say, I expected the Windows one to get the highest dedupe, and it got the, the worst dedupe, but no simple answers here. Okay, so the, the, the talk is going to be about how do we do, how can we estimate these numbers? But before I go to how, let me just a ask, answer a question which should arise here. Well, well does it really matter? Why, why are you trying to, to solve this problem? And there's a number of reasons. I'm going to give you two or, or two and a half main reasons here. The big one is sizing. So think of, uh, of this. You're storing a petabyte of data, and it has either two to one compre data reduction saving or three to one or four to one. You're not saving money unless you buy less storage. So you can take a petabyte of data that has terrific data reduction, 10 to 1. But if you're paying for the one petabyte of storage just in case, because you don't know how much it's going to reduce, you're saving nothing. So that's one big one. Uh, the other is for comparing storage uh, and storage prices. You have one storage device that has compression, has dedupe, it has a single pr uh, an initial price. You have another one with different attributes and different prices, but 
the amount of money you're going to pay at the end depends on the data reduction. Uh, it's also not only a question of really choosing the right storage, but within a single storage, you could have some data, uh, some resources allocated to data reduction, and they're limited. And you want to invest them in the right places. You don't want to try to compress something that's not compressible. That's a waste of resources. So, so those are the, the, big, the two big reasons. And the third one that I'll say is, is customers are asking for this. Uh, th this comes up all the time. It's if, if you're not convinced, then when a customer comes along, uh, then people start being convinced that you want to do something about it. How to estimate? So there's really two options to go here. The first one, which will not follow, but I'll mention, is just rule of thumb estimations. Uh, like I told you, we can learn from prior experience. We know that some stuff has great data reduction and some does not. Uh, so for example, here's a, a website called Data Reduction Estimator from Evaluator Group. You want, you can Google it, you'll find it. Uh, and what they'll do is they'll say, okay, databases, they typically have a reduction of three to one. How much databases data do you have, etc., for virtual desktops, etc. And then they'll sum up, so, so you can have an estimation of how much you're gaining. Now, if you've seen the, the previous slide with the VM repositories, you'll know there's no guarantees here. I, I mean, this is just some experience from some people, but the, the results can really vary greatly. So there's no guarantees. This is just for getting a, a, a feeling. If you want guarantees, if you want to really understand, you want to look at the data and understand the data. And this is what the, we're going to talk about. Okay. So problem statement that we're trying to re answer here, estimating data reduction. You're given a large data set. How large? You, you choose how large. Petabyte, terabyte, uh, whatever. We want to understand the potential benefit from compression and deduplication. And uh, there's a lot of subtleties of what is the potential. Uh, I'm not going to dive into that. You want to, uh, we can talk after, afterwards or, or questions. Uh, but this is what we're trying to answer. And I'm going to dive right to the end of summarizing all the results that we have. But the first summary, <laughs> the first point to make is you have compression and deduplication. The results in this domain of estimation of data reduction are really, really different for the two uh, techniques. So compression and deduplication, I'm going to show results for compression and deduplication. They're going to be very far apart. Uh, so first, let's ask, how would you do this naively? Or, or is this an easy problem to begin with? Uh, so naively, what you'll do is you just go to your data, scan it in its entirety, and then you can do the compression or the deduplication and, and see what you get. So a full scan of the data, th this is going to be costly in time. Uh, but with compression, at least you'll do this with very low memory. With dedup, you don't even get that. It's going to be really heavy. So with compression, you're just reading the data, compressing. OK, how much did I get? Let's accumulate this number. Just need one counter and a buffer to compress. And you throw it away, and you continue. With dedup, the problem is that Understanding deduplication, you need to record all the data or all the content that you've seen before in order to find whether it appeared in the past. So you have to be stateful. And this means, OK, I can scan your petabyte data, no problem. Uh, I need a machine with 256 gigabytes of RAM, but I'm not sure that's going to be enough just for the estimation, and we want it to be a lighter, uh, a lighter operation. Which brings us to our first non-naive solution, which says, let's do an advanced scan. I want to relax the need uh, of high memory in the estimation. So I'm relaxing first. It's not going to be an accurate evaluation anymore. I'm going to do it with low memory, but it's now going to be an estimation, which is going to be good enough for us. Uh, so this is based on a paper from MSST in, in 
2012. Um, and so, so now we've relaxed the need uh, for, <coughs> for large memory. You can run with one megabyte for all I care and you can get a very good estimation. Then there's another step. So this was full scan. So, so it's gonna take time, but at least we can do it with the light job. Uh, the really interesting part says, well, maybe you don't need to read everything. Maybe we can do sampling or random sampling, which is something we really like doing. Uh, this is basically, let's do a survey on the data and understand from it. And here, the results are very different as well. So sampling, you can do very fast and very accurate for compression saving. And we have a paper on this one as well. Uh, the trade-off between the amount of sampling you need and the accuracy you can get is very good. It's very favorable. Uh, with deduplication, this is a hard problem. So I, I, I'm skipping to the end. I say we can do sampling for deduplication as well, but the trade-off is not as, as great as it was. A and this is far more challenging, so this is hard. So I have here basically three results and I want to go and say a bit about uh, each one of them and th that's going to be kind of the rest of the talk. So compression first, <laughs> let's, let's do that. Uh, compression, uh, I'll have just one slide of it. We have a tool, uh, it's a tool for IBM storage called Compressed Tomato. Now the really great thing about Compressed Tomato is the name of compressed tomato, it's really cool. Uh, the fact that it's an official IBM name, you can Google IBM compressed tomato, you'll find it. Uh, that's just about all I have to say. No, it's, it's not. Uh, it's sampling-based compression ratio estimation, that's what the tool is about. Uh, and I'll say it's not as easy as it sounds. There's many subtleties in how you actually do the, the compression, the sampling for compression, but you can handle these and they is, can be solved. Uh, what is really important here is we give an analysis, an accuracy analysis, mathematical guarantees uh, for probabilities. And this is crucial. And why is it crucial? Because the reason we can be so fast about our estimation is we know exactly how much we want to sample. We don't want to oversample because then you're taking too much time. You don't want to undersample because then you'll be inaccurate. So we have this, these fancy graphs that I put here, and I'm not going to go over it's 30 minute talk after all, but you can, you can look in the paper if you want. Uh, but for example, uh, for uh, this is uh, the, the timing on this, it's 3.2 terabyte volume. It took four hours to do the, the scan on, on one of our machines and doing the same estimation with very, very accurate results took 73 seconds. That's the type of uh, time saving you can get from doing this. Uh, I'll mention, I said there are subtleties. I'll mention there is an impossibility result coming from the theory of computer science that says, listen, there's no way you can accurately uh, estimate Lempel-Ziv compression saving uh, using sampling with, these, with, with this amount of, of sampling, uh, with this amount of samples. There's just no way it's mathematically proven. And here it's, it's really, uh, I'll quote Albert Einstein, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not because we are doing Lempel-Ziv Every time you run zip, Lempel-Ziv is running. Most of the compressors do Lempel-Ziv, but it's not textbook Lempel-Ziv. It's not the theoretical aspect of it. So when you go and you implement compression in practice, you, you add some locality properties that allow you to then do the sampling really efficiently. So I'm closing the compression part of the talk now, and uh, I'll move to the more challenging one, which is uh, deduplication. Okay, so deduplication now. Uh, deduplication, as I said, is much harder, and I, I want to give you a hint as to why it's harder. So uh, I'm tr I'll give you a sort of an example. So, so take this data set. Now, uh, I know it's, it's not a data set, it's a picture, but metaphorically, <laughs> it's a data set. 
in the sense that when you have two blue areas, that's the dupe. It's the same. When you have like different patterns, that's not the dupe. Okay, so so we'll work with this metaphor. But in reality, we don't see the beautiful picture. What we actually see is a big black box. It has IBM on the top and everything. And when you do sampling, what you actually do is you poke holes in this box. So we look at a number of locations, and we look at more locations, and we try to make sense uh, about the entire picture. So there's a lot of unseen here, and we're trying to understand what happens there. That's sampling. Uh, now, if you look at, at this picture, you can actually say quite a bit about the deduplication here, because there's a lot of sky, and we see a lot of blue here. So we are going to learn something. Not too accurate, but we are learning something. And I want to show you a different picture, which kind of drives to the point of why it's hard to do de duplication estimation. Uh, 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 so here's the picture. It's really cool. There's no repetitions at all. But for the fact that I copied it twice, so you have two to one deduplication exactly. Everything appears exactly one. But now let's do sampling. So we close the box. And we start looking. So this is the first point. Now, in order to see that there is any deduplication at all, so the difference between 2 to 1 to no deduplication saving at all, you must, but you must really find the exact same location on the bottom part. Now, statistically speaking, this is a low probability event. You're, you're very unlikely to hit this. But OK, we're not sampling just two points. Or sampling a lot of points. Uh, but here we have the birthday paradox that says, look, you're going to have to sample at least square root of n, if n is the amount of boxes here, in order to see a single uh, repetition. And then we say, OK, there is some dedupe here. How much? That's a more difficult one. W what about triple collisions? How, how do we identify these? So here again, I'm, I'm moving to the theory of computer science and saying there are results that say you need to uh, sample and now go back to, to your uh, um, computer science classes, omega of n over log n. So basically, this is in computer science, it's, uh, this says you need a large fraction of the data in order to actually make any sense out of it. That's the theory. So that's kind of saying, OK, uh, this is a very nice work by uh, Valiant and Valiant that appeared in 2011. I'm going to come back to it I in, a, in a bit. OK, so let's, let's talk about the next step that we had there in the box, which is an advanced can. We wanna, we're saying, OK, you need to see almost all of the data. Let's just look at all of the data. And, but we want low memory. And the, the idea for advanced scans comes from uh, the theory of streaming algorithms. Uh, and basically, in a nutshell, you're scanning everything, but you're keeping a small footprint in memory to understand what you have. And, and out of this very small footprint, you're able to give very good estimation. The way it really works is, you think of, and, and this is the way deduplication is actually performed. Each chunk has some small fingerprint. Uh, and this is what allows us to identify repetitions of entire chunks. We're, we're working with these small fingerprints. The sampling is done on the domain of these fingerprints, on the hashes. That's kind of, a, I'm really not saying a lot, but what I'm saying is, when you do random sampling of your data, you're looking at random locations, LBAs if it's a block device, or, or files if it's a file system, or locations in files. Uh, when we want to do estimation of deduplication, we can do sampling, but it has to be on the domain of the hashes of the fingerprints rather than the area. And that's the basis of it all. You can do it, but you have to pay a price of a full scan. So you're 
doing a full scan, but you're remembering only very little, only a very small sample out of this full scan. Um, I, I'll just say that oh, this was also implemented as a tool for IBM storage. It's called the Data Reduction Estimation Tool. You can say whatever you want, but the name is not as cool as Compressed Estimator. I, I'm sorry, we had nothing in... If you have good ideas, please. I, I mean, we're, we're stuck with this name. Uh, but the Data Reduction Estimation Tool does a scan and merge and this really drives through why you need the small footprint. Because you can sample, you can scan one device, uh, one uh, volume of storage, and another volume of storage, and the third one. And now you can merge these little files of, of footprints and understand what would be the overall deduplication ratio. Now, if we were doing a full scan without the low memory, you'd need to move these gigabytes of data from location to location. So you need to carry a lot of baggage around to get the cross volume uh, deduplication. So, okay, that's kind of the second part we, we talked about with, you know, we talked about sampling with compression, we talked about full scan, but advanced scan with deduplication, and now we're getting to the last point. So what about sampling with deduplication? So solutions in practice, and this is what was around until 2015, uh, I, I would say. Uh, just to show you how hard it is. So the intuition or, or the theory of computer science says you can't do it in a, in a very good fashion. Uh, but maybe it's just, be, uh, how, how do you prove these impossibilities? The, the, the point with these are, look, we're going to show you two data sets that have very different deduplication ratios. And when you sample the two of them, you can't tell them apart. That's how you show an impossibility result. But maybe these, these two data sets that you brought are just not relevant to the real world. And in the real world, you can do the sampling and you can succeed very well with it. So let's try. So let's just do a random sample and understand the deduplication ratio on this sample. So I'm showing you a graph uh, where the actual deduplication ratio is 0.45. Uh, that's 55% saving. This is one of the, the hypervisors of the, the VM data that I showed you in the beginning. And what happens if I sample 1%, 2%, 5%, etc., all the way to 20%? And you see, the estimations are awful. We're nowhere close to the real deduplication ratio if we only look at a sample. Okay, so that's the very dumb act of just taking the sample and finding the deduplication on the sample. Let's do something clever. Let's, there's all sorts of heuristics out there. And actually, this is a problem that has been studied in many domains of computer science. It's unique elements, estimation in databases. It has applications in biologies. How many species do we have? We're, we're, there's a lot of prior art dealing with this. So we're talking about papers from 81, etc. So we took kind of the top of the line on this aspect and one of these heuristics, and we tried to run them on our data. <coughs> and this is what we got. So again, we're sampling 1%, 2%, etc. And the results are awful again. They're awful to the other side. Now you can tell me, okay, so take the average between the two, and that'll be exactly the correct one. But uh, yeah, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> but uh, that actually works with this one. But this is the state that we have in practice. Nothing really close to, to acceptable. And then we move to theory. So remember the, the paper that I mentioned, the very nice one that said, said you, you've, you have to sample at least n over log n of the data. So they actually have, it's not only a lower bound, it's also an upper bound. They have an algorithm that can actually do this with n over log n. It's really sophisticated, it uses linear programming. And we said, let's give it a go. Let's give it a go. Uh, but there's lots of problems here. So you take 
an algorithm in theory, and you start hitting problems like, okay, you have the order of n over log n. How much, is, uh, how much do I actually sample here? I mean, th this is really cool for, for a theory of computer science. That's not an actual number. What is the, the O has some hidden constant? So do I sample 10%, 1%, 50%? Um, and, and there's a lot of, a lot of issues here. Uh, there's high memory usage. We didn't talk about compression. So we handle all of this, and we have a nice paper uh, from FAST 2016. And I, I'm just going to show you the, the results of what we found and, and one, one of the nice, cool things that we got here. So this is a very complicated graph, and I am going to slow down and look at it. We ran 30 tests with 1% sample, and then 30 tests with 2% sample size, etc. It's the same workload that we had before, 45% dedupe ratio. And what you see is when you do 1%, and, and I just connected them with the line so you see the noise to it. When you do 1%, it's terribly noisy. The results are all over the place, which means that 1% was just not enough sample. But what we see, and it's really amazing, is when you get around to 8%, you are really surrounded. All of the tests are really close to the real value. When you go to 10%, we're even better. And like, I would live very well with 8 or 10% sample here. Now, the problem is that in real life, when I run the test, I don't get all these 30 numbers. I get one. So I'm going to look at this number and say, okay, is this too noisy or not? I have no idea. I don't see the neighbors around it. So we developed an, al an additional technique. It's also based on linear programming. that actually gives you a, a, what we call, so this is, by the way, it's called the unseen algorithm. Unseen because you're estimating the unseen. Uh, I, I do want to make one point, though. Even I as we look at it this way, these are awesome results because if you remember, this was the case before this. So it's far, far better than what we had before. Uh, but again, how do we know that we have converged? <coughs> and, and the answer here is, is our kind of <coughs> additional algorithm. What we give you back is rather than giving you a single point at each each location, we're going to give you an upper bound and a lower bound. We can tell you that based on the sample that we've seen, the deduplication ratio can be anywhere in the range between the bottom red line and the top red line. And now you can really, you can really know when to stop. So this is the new algorithm we've devised. It's really cool because you can start sampling and as you go along, you realize, oh, I need more samples, more samples, more, blah, blah. now I'm good to stop. Uh, this is how it looks basically now that I, I've, I've moved all the noise away. Uh, this is a result, so we're doing the same hypervisor test, and you can see that at around 10, 11, 12%, you're already really nicely converged. You can stop there, you're very happy. Uh, I'm gonna show you different workloads just to, to get a feeling how it looks. So this is with compression. I told you we handle compression as well. Uh, and this is a VM repository. Again, I I I another one which wants to point out that you don't have to be in the middle. It's not an average between the two dots. It could be on the top. It could be on the bottom. Uh, this is a database that has basically no deduplication. And we converge after 3% of sampling. So you can stop very quickly. Uh, and this is a VDI environment that really gets very high deduplication ratio. Uh, and we also converge very quickly. So when do we converge quickly or slowly? I have this last complicated graph that says, okay, so for 1% sampling, that would be the top line. And that these are different workloads. So this is a uh, workload that has high deduplication ratio, 
medium, etc., very bad deduplication ratio. The top line is 1%, the next one is 2%, etc. So what do you see? Look at the graph and tell me what do you, what do you actually see here? Yes, very good. <laughs> That's an elephant. I had to put that in. Um, we have the elephant, and, and the, uh, the interesting part about this elephant, if you have very high deduplication ratio or low deduplication ratio, it means you're in the trunk or in the tail, and you can stop very quickly. <coughs> the hard part is the medium ones, the workload that have kind of 50% or, or all the way between 50, even 80% uh, um, deduplication ratio. That's, that's the difficult part. Um, and this is consistent across all workloads we've seen. So, summary. We're, we're at the end. We have compression, which is relatively easy. You can do fast. You can do accurate. Deduplication is much more complex. Uh, and we have tools for this as well. Uh, again, this sampling is really cool, but many times you're going to have to sample 15% of your data, and now you have to do the calculation of 15% random reads versus a fift a full scan. What's quicker? It depends on the media you're, you're working with. So if it's all on flash, go with the 15%. You're saving a lot of time and effort. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you.